SEO sounds great, right? Like, oh, you just write some articles and then people see them and they come to you. It sounds amazing, right? Well, it's actually very tough. And if you don't do it the right way, you're not going to get leads. You may even get traffic, but that traffic might not be the type of traffic that converts to leads. And really, anything we do in marketing shouldn't be about getting leads. It should be about getting customers. And how can we make sure that what we're doing with our SEO is actually going to drive opportunities and customers? Well, that's why I had Sam Dunning on the show. He is amazing. This guy is the host of Breaking B2B podcast. He runs an agency called Breaking B2B. And what he does is he helps companies set up their SEO and their content strategies so that they start getting great leads, they turn into opportunities, and they close the deals. This is a really good one. He goes into several actionable items that you can plug in with your SEO strategy right now, and it generates opportunities for you. Let's do it. Welcome to Scale Your SaaS, the podcast that gives you proven techniques and formulas for boosting your revenue and achieving your dream exit. Brought to you by a guy who's done just that multiple times. Here's your host, Matt Wallach. Hello and welcome to Scale Your SaaS. Thank you very much for being here. My name is Matt Wallach. My job is to help you scale your SaaS, just like the show is called. And we do that through making sure you understand how to generate a whole bunch of great leads, making sure you know how to close those leads, and how do you build a team around yourself to be able to do it for you. So that's what I do. I help people do that. People come to me so I can coach them on those things. But I also want to put experts in front of you and line people up who are innovators and creators in the B2B world so that they can help you to know exactly how to do this. And today we have an amazing expert with us. I am so excited. We've got Sam Dunning with us. Sam, how are you doing? Hey, Matt. Thanks for having me on, man. Looking forward to the chat. Likewise, I am as well. And Sam, he is awesome. So let me make sure you all know who he is. So Sam, he's the founder and host at Breaking B2B, an awesome deal he's doing there. I'm going to tell you more about it. But he also runs a podcast called Breaking B2B. So absolutely check that out. What he's doing is he's helping B2B companies scale leads and revenue using SEO strategies. These things drive results. And Sam, he is an expert at digital marketing. So I'm really excited about how he's going to help us understand how to generate a bunch of great leads. So Sam, Thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Looking forward to digging in and hopefully sharing some insights, ideas, and unusual strategies. I love it. I love it. I can't wait. So tell me, what have you been up to lately and what's coming up? Yeah, yeah, sounds good. So I actually, I've been in the, for my sins, I've been in the website SEO organic search game for probably more than I care to remember. That like was pretty much my second job after coming out of the retail game so originally in the uk i was selling camera equipment and media equipment in a little store called jessup's and i soon realized that i hated working with the general public and like the short story <laughs> long or the long story short rather is that after a year or so of kind of selling cameras selling equipment having the general public yell at me for asking how they were and if i could help and getting sick of that a job came up in for a website agency and that, that's how I got into the world because my cousin was involved in it as well as another threat, another friend learned the wonderful world of building, designing websites from the ground up. Um, and in my opinion, kind of getting thrown in at the deep end of the startup of a startup is one of the best things you can do for hands on experience and literally like jumping into boiling water. And <laughs> totally, <laughs> so I, totally probably a bit like yourself. I'd imagine Matt. I, I started with, with the sales background. So. I kind of got into a bit of a jack of an all trades role, like selling websites, project managing them, eventually getting into SEO and other digital marketing strategies and kind of learning right at the deep end, working with the team, kind of asking questions about what's what, started building my own stuff and learning the hard way and kind of fast forward to today. So 2024, I set up my own agency of start of this year. So breaking B2B and we'll be right back. Hey, it's Matt. If you're anything like me, you check your website analytics and you see people coming to your site, but you have no idea who they are or what they're doing. Plus, why aren't they converting into leads? That's why I now use Lead Feeder. This thing is slick. Lead Feeder is a tool that shows me which companies are coming to my site, plus which pages they visited and in which order. So I can see their interest level just by what they're doing. You can use it too. You can track your site visitors' behavior and integrate the data from Lead Feeder with your CRM that helps make your lead generation efforts more targeted. The result, website traffic converts to sales. Click the link in the description and go to 
leadfeeder.com for a free demo and get a free extended premium trial when you let the rep know that you heard Lead Feeder through the Scale Your SaaS podcast. Finally know who's visiting your site with Lead Feeder. Do it. And we're back. Essentially, we, after working agency side for, for many, many years, got kind of tired of the the classic SEO agency that, that promises you loads of traffic and basically tries to mm-hmm. deliver on fluffy metrics. So we'll say like you're top for 20 keywords and you're getting tons and tons of traffic, but then the founder or the marketing leader on the back end is like, that all looks good on paper and the graphs look awesome, but there's not really many qualified demos or many qualified sales calls coming off the back of it. So we very much took the opposite approach and we, we kind of take the time to understand how businesses work, what their the ICP actually is, what they want from the strategy. And as you know, Matt, like the most, one of the most important things as a, as a SaaS or a tech founder is that your company's driving a steady flow of qualified pipeline rather than just random leads or a ton of traffic because otherwise it doesn't really make an impact. Absolutely. It's so frustrating when you're like, oh, we're generating leads, but none of the leads are quality. None of them fit the ICP. It's just very frustrating. So I love it when marketing is aligned with sales and marketing has a key understanding of what the ICP is and who we should be going after and what are the best leads. And they're feeding sales the best types of opportunities. I love that you are so aligned with that, Sam. Yeah, exactly. And I think because I've got that selling background, so I started as a seller and then went into marketing and kind of learned, I guess you could almost say the hard way because I was getting fed these terrible leads, these terrible marketing qualified leads and working them. And I soon realized what the difference was between a good sales call and a terrible one and thought, well, if we're going to start generating these for our own business and then eventually moving on to serving clients, we better make sure that they're actually worth their time and yeah, when when you like you say when you're you're a founder selling, you soon learn what makes a good lead and a terrible one. Yeah, no doubt, that's absolutely true. <laughs> so, tell me, how did you start breaking B two B? Where did that all come from? Yeah, so I was at another. I was actually a third share of another web web and SEO agency for a good three or four years, and eventually, because that we were there was three of us that ran that business, and eventually wanted to break off. We weren't that niche, so we tended to serve almost anyone and anyone that needed a website or SEO strategy. And then after running my own podcast, which this year also renamed to Breaking B2B, where we basically interview B2B tech marketing leaders and they share their growth strategies, what's driving leads and revenue. And I also do solo episodes, again, around B2B SEO, B2B website tips with unusual ideas. I kind of niched down after a while into B2B tech and service companies and thought, I've been doing this a long time. I enjoy the most working with B2B teams because they tend to have a marketing team that understands the value of making your website your best sales rep. They understand the value of organic search that when it's done right, that it can be a a qualified, sustainable demo or lead driver. So I thought probably makes sense to niche down and, and do my own thing with that, leverage the podcast, interview marketing leaders, and also offer this as a service to those B2B tech teams. Um, so yeah, pretty much the start of this year, kick that off. And we've just, yes, been been steadily growing since. I love it. I love it. What are you seeing as you're as you're working with your clients? What are you seeing are some of the biggest mistakes that they've made trying to figure all this out on their own? Loads, loads. So I suppose I'll look at it from a from an SEO and, and website lens, as that's my my niche and my focus. And feel free to drill down in, in what you see fit. So one of the biggest mistakes I see with tech companies, SaaS companies on the SEO front is that they, there's a few, but I'll start with a couple of the common culprits is they see SEO as a tick box activity. So what quite often happens, Matt, is that let's say the the marketing or the founder or one of the, the execs at the team will say, well, I'm, con- I'm starting to get annoyed because I'm constantly seeing every time I t- search for our offer or I search for our service or s- I search directly for what we do or the problem we fix, constantly see competitors showing up above us in organic search results on Google. Like We need to start addressing that. So then they'll go to whoever looks after the marketing. Maybe they've got a team of marketing on of one or maybe they've got just someone who does a bit of marketing within the team. And they say to this exec, look, we're, we're falling behind on SEO. Can you do some SEO? And then this marketing person on their team is like, 
Sure, I can do some SEO. I have got 99 other jobs to do this week, but I'll do a bit of SEO for you when I've got time. They say, great. So what they do is they they log on to a classic SEO tool like maybe Hrefs or SEMrush or something similar. They go, okay, I'm going to do some SEO. I'll look up a keyword that's relevant to what we do. They write a blog post on it because they find a keyword that's relatively low difficulty that's going to generate a bit of traffic. They write a blog post, maybe because they're so busy, they run the blog post idea through ChatGPT, publish it on the website, job done, forget about it, go back to their other 99 tasks for the week. A few months later, the, some time passes, and then the, the, the leadership team, or the founder says, oh, did, did you manage to, to do some SEO? And they say, yeah, I, I did some SEO. I, uh, I wrote an article. It got us a little bit of traffic. And then the, the leadership might say, okay, cool. Did it get any leads? And they'll say, no, you didn't ask me to get any leads. You just said, quote unquote, do some SEO. I did some SEO. And that's where it all goes wrong, right? It's just seen as this checkbox activity. Do Chuck out a couple articles and um, hope for the best. Whereas, of course, the best SEO strategies are built by knowing what your focused clients are actually searching for when they have high intent for your offering, your SaaS solution, your technology, or maybe they're comparing you to alternatives or looking for the best in your sector. And we can drill into that if you wish. But it's yeah, it's just so often seen as a, a tick box activity and that's why it doesn't drive pipeline or leads. Yeah, it's so smart. I, I, I totally agree. I see, I've seen that happen a lot and it, it really is kind of a misalignment, like I said, with marketing and sales and with your SEO people and also from leadership, not giving the right direction of exactly what needs to happen. Um, but you're right. I think that, you know, I've heard, I'm not an SEO expert, but I've heard SEO experts like yourself talk about aiming at the right segment of the, of the target. And you just talked about high intent people, people who are searching with a feel of like they need to have a solution. So can you talk more about that and, and how that all works? Yeah, sure thing. So you're exactly right. So where many SaaS tech companies get SEO wrong is that they start from the wrong wrong lens, really. So they're looking at SEO and they're maybe using tools, be it SEMRAS, HREFs or what else. But they're trying to focus on getting as much traffic to their site as possible. And that often means you're looking at what's called top of the funnel SEO. And that's usually things like questions queries so let's let's pretend you're in the calendar scheduling space which is one I often use in the SaaS space it might be like um i don't know how to how to build a how to build scheduling software or how to set up a scheduler on my website or those kind of query based searches which how to searches or best ways to do searches or those kind of question searches often yield a lot of traffic but they're usually what we call informative searches which are going to bring up a blog article and at best, if someone is searching a how-to search or similar, they're going to fly onto your article, maybe skim the information they need. At very best, they might sign up for a lead magnet or check out your podcast if the blog article is designed in an engaging way and makes it easy for you to do search. At worst, they'll skim the article, fly off, get about their day. Whereas kind of what we call revenue-focused SEO takes an opposite approach. It thinks, what is my target customer searching for exactly when they are ready to have a sales conversation now? And if we fly it back to, let's say, calendar scheduling in the SaaS space, they might search for something like, I don't know, best calendar scheduling software. Or they might, a really good one in the SaaS space is comparing you to alternatives. So calendar scheduling, that might be Calendly alternatives or Chili Piper alternatives or Revenue Hero alternatives. In that case there, they already know some of the solutions about, but they want to make sure, as you know, usually when it comes to evaluating a tech vendor, you, you evaluate three or four options. So that, that person is already aware that they, they need a solution, but they're comparing their options. So they're looking for an alternative. That's a really good way to scoop up demos. Another one is industry or niche focused, i.e. calendar scheduling software for sales teams, calendar, calendar scheduling software for HR teams or recruitment teams or whatever the niche, the money niches that you focus on. So those are some really good kind of key strategies, basically understanding exactly what your prospects are searching for when they want to have a sales conversation or the niches that they're going to search within, i.e. your money niches, the ones you serve well, have the problem you fix and have money to invest in your offer, or the common alternatives that folks might compare you against. Those are a good place to start.
I love it. It's so great seeing a, a smart mind dive into some of this stuff. And you, it's very clear that you're experienced on this, Sam, and, and I love hearing your, your insights on how all this works. What I want to figure out is, you, you know, some people think SEO is whatever you do on the on the page. And then we know there's off page. And cause, so can you talk yeah. about like, what's more important? Are they both important? Like, how, do, how does a company manage all that? Yeah, that's... You're exactly right. And there's so many myths and com- SEO often gets overcomplicated. And for many SaaS websites, i.e. tech sites that want to drive a steady stream of demos or sales calls, SEO often gets overcomplicated. So so-called specialists will go in and say, you need to spend months on auditing your website. Uh, you need to do all this technical stuff. You need to do all this off-page stuff. You need to build tons of links. And the truth is, really, in most cases, you don't. The, the common issues with SaaS websites we see is they're super thin on content, especially if they're startup or early stage. Like they might even only have five pages like home, what we do, who we serve, pricing, results, book a demo, something like that. Maybe so true. Like, so true. Um, and that, that's one of the common culprits. They're just too thin on content. And the, probably the content is there hasn't been well optimized. So my main kind of almost a step by step, if you will, is identify your money keywords like we just talked about there, the main offers you want to you wanna actually get leads for, the main niches you serve, what are your common alternatives, um, and, and other, other terms that someone might search for around your offer, like best calendar scheduling software or whatever's relevant to your niche. Run those kind of keywords through a tool, be it HF, SEMrush, make sure you're going after one, ones that have got a little bit of volume but aren't too competitive. Once you've made that list, then you want it to actually rank on your site so this is where you actually need to create content but the best way to do that is you need to measure you need to do something what's called measuring the intent or identifying the intent of the keyword so let's say let's say we wanted to beat our competitors let's say we were going for chili piper alternatives because we're calendar scheduling what i'd do is i'd literally google that keyword I'd see in the organic results what the top three organic non-paid results. And usually for compared to alternative keywords, it's a listicle. And what I'd be my bat is it's an article with, for example, top 10 Chili Piper alternatives. And the way that you can, usually the, the way those articles are structured is they'll have a bit of an intro and then you'll usually position your own offer as number one. And the best way to do that is to actually not just talk about how great you are, but talk about your points of differentiation, what you do that the competitors don't. Maybe you have a table that says, this is us, this is our common competitors. Then maybe you have some screenshots of your product and then maybe customer reviews and then a call to action to book a demo or free sign up. And then you have your other nine or 10 competitors below with a fair summary assessment. You don't slate them, you don't diss them because you don't want to get a legal suite on your ass. Um, So it's just sensible, fair play. But what I've advised is if you're doing that and you're building some of those pages is you look to blow those pages out of the water. So if the current organic number one is top 10 alternatives, I'd try and double it. So I'd go for top 20 alternatives and make my article literally best in class by all means possible. Um, so that's called measuring the search intent, understanding what kind of page Google spits out. But for example, if, if we took another type of keyword, so instead of doing alternative, if we went for, let's say, best calendar scheduling software, it might be that that brings up a landing page opposed to an article listicle. So in that case, we'd look at what's ranking well. It might be that a a competitor like Proposify probably ranks well. What's another one? PandaDoc, they're probably up there. So we'd look at how they've structured their landing page. And what I usually recommend is you you take notes on any gaps on their page and how you can one-up it. So it could be that you add, it could be that those competitors have got a lot of text. Maybe they talk about the value prop at the start. Maybe then they have some use cases. Maybe they have some results. And then maybe they've got a summary at the bottom of the landing page. So I'd think, okay, I'm going to, at the top of the, the page, I'm going to embed a YouTube video that's a how-to on this specific topic. As quite often, if you embed YouTube videos, it can boost the SEO from my experience. And in your result on the Google page, on the Google listing search engine result page, you can sometimes get an image of your video, which is a little hack for improving your click-through rate. And then I'd look for gaps. So there's Google have got this framework 
that they rolled out a while ago with a helpful content update called EEAT, stands for Experience, Expertise, Authority, Trust. So they want to see that whoever's putting together your content on page has hands-on expertise on the subject matter. And where so many folks are getting SEO and content wrong is they're just spitting out copy from AI and maybe making a few tweaks. But as you've probably noticed, Matt, if some AI content, if you, you read it, you almost instantly know it's written by a bot because it says stuff like, supercharge your revenues with our all-in-one tech wizardry to drive revenue like never before. And it's like, if I land on a page and read that nonsense, I'm bouncing within two seconds. Um, no so kidding. yeah, if you can... <laughs> A dark art of SEO or a secret art of SEO is actually leveraging customer insights. Mm. So if you can bring up on landing pages things like common problems they bring to your sales teams, common frustrations they have, um, common jobs they want to get done and leverage that content, that's that's super powerful. Of course, using examples of your product and use cases, video run-throughs, demo examples, etc. But also leveraging FAQs. So FAQs are really powerful, especially on landing pages. So if you can leverage not just any actual ones that you get on the topic so if you're writing a landing page about the best proposal software then how much does it cost do i get an account manager what's your refund policy how long does it take to set up why should i use you over your common competitors like these are these are common questions you're getting on a sales call like straight away leverage them most tech companies are way too scared to share these things most tech companies are scared to share pricing let alone answer stuff from sales calls and if you can do that not only does it help you from an SEO perspective, it shows transparency, it speeds up sales cycles, and it's actually an asset that your sales team can link out in emails. Um, so those are a few things. I mean, there is technical things we could talk about, like making sure your, your URL has the main keyword in and your meta title and description has the main keyword in, et cetera. Um, but those are just tactical things that you can do from a simple level to make sure your page is best in class and has a prime position to rank before you th consider off-page SEO, like building links and citations. Love it. Love it. This is gold here, Sam. I'm really grateful that you're sharing this with us. What I want to do as we kind of wrap up here is how can we summarize what if you're if you're an early stage software leader and you're like, OK, well, I realize SEO is important. What should they start doing now so that they can start making this happen and start getting some results from SEO? Yeah, it's a good question. So the advantage that a lot of smaller SaaS companies have is that the giants within their niche or within their sector have so much red tape. So mm. the giant the giant SaaS True. companies, like just to publish one page, man, it has to go through various levels of leadership, get sign off. So you could be looking at from ideation of kind of one landing page, one article, a month, even longer, just to get one page signed off, a copy, and then, then it's got to go to their web design team, then to their dev team, and then it's eventually published. So if you're a same smaller, thing on the development side for the product too, by the way, it takes forever to spit out product when you're big. Exactly. So if you're not that big, you have an insane advantage because you can, my recommendation for anyone is to publish at scale. So if you can identify what we talked about, those money keywords, if you can really exhaust every single niche that you serve, every single alternative search, everything that's going to drive those high intent prospects that are ready to have a sales conversation through an SEO lens, and then build out a page for each one of those use cases, be it an article page, depending on the intent or a product page or solution page, whatever's relevant. And if you can start publishing them at scale, even if they don't rank well instantly, you've got them online, Google's going to start calling them and you can improve them over time. Meanwhile, your competitors are publishing one or two pages a month, where begging leadership to get them, get them signed off. So that is like a super advantage that SaaS companies have over their, their big monsters. I love it. It's very big advantage. And this has been really incredible stuff that you shared with us here, Sam. Really appreciate it. It's clear that you are an expert in the space. How can our audience learn more about you and connect with you if they're looking to get help with their SEO? Yeah, appreciate it, man. So there's three main ways. The first is to follow me on LinkedIn, Sam Dunning. I share tips and ideas, case studies, examples on SEO and B2B websites most days. Second is to check out the podcast, Breaking B2B. So we have interviews with B2B tech marketing leaders, they share their growth strategies and I run solo episodes on SEO and B2B marketing. Or the third is if you're maybe frustrated that your competitors are constantly ahead of you on organic search results on Google and, and you're not driving a steady flow of demos or leads, then you can book a call on breakingb2b.com. Awesome. Okay, we'll put all that into the show notes. So if you're listening, go grab that and that way you can connect with Sam and potentially chat with him and see how he can help. Sam, this has been amazing. Thanks so much for coming in and sharing all this with us. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.
Absolutely. Everybody out there, thank you as well. By the way, if this was helpful, make sure you are subscribed to the show. You do not want to miss out on any other amazing experts like Sam. You could tell the amount of insights he just shared. Lots of people do that every week here on the show. So thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. We will see you next time. Take care. Thanks for listening to Scale Your SaaS. For more help on finding great leads and closing more deals, go to mattwallach.com. 